required audit documentation. So we kind of went over what the documentation does, its purpose. Now we've got some items that are required. Now, this is not a complete list. There will be other pieces of documentation that are required, also pieces of documentation in practice that you might view as necessary, but you know the AICPA or PCAOB may not say it's necessary. So again, just like uh, if any of you have real audit experience, this may vary. And again, not, not a full complete list, but these are some of the bigger ticket items that we will see on the exam. Again, this documentation exists to support the report and opinion or the end deliverable, right? If it's financial statements that you've reviewed or prepared uh, and support the audit in accordance with generally accepted auditing standards. Documentation should have evidence on who prepared it and that it was reviewed by another auditor. And again, sign off procedures, whether that's in your internal accounting firm software where you can just check off that you've signed on something or it's in the work paper. You put your initials or your name and what date you signed off on it, you know, however that looks particularly for you. This is the proof of work for reasonable assurance. It's kind of like, hey, uh, great school project, but where is the evidence that it was you who worked on it? <laughs> you know, not, not someone else. So it's kind of like show your work. That's essentially what we're dealing with here, right? I myself back in the day in elementary school did not like showing my work. I wanted to just show the answer. I hated throwing it all out. But when you show your work, people know you're the one who actually did it. So required documentation. So the written engagement letter, super important. I mean, that's the cornerstone of it all. That's your written contract on what you're supposed to be doing in this engagement. We do have a whole section on that as well. So that's pretty important. Audit plan detailing the, so this is what's done in the planning stage and what you discuss in the planning stage, you're gonna pop that right into the documentation file. Again, like anything, the objectives of this engagement, what you're trying to do, how are you going to go about this audit? Any critical audit correspondence, I mean, it would be impractical to include every single email. I mean, especially if we're talking a you know, massive client, but, and maybe in some cases there is a massive database just saving every email just in case you need it. But, you know, we're, we're thinking just, you know, within reason. So anything super important, an email from a third party confirming an amount or an email from the controller making a claim or an assertion, something important. Any representation letters, so from the auditor, from management, any letters from any party like, taking responsibility for anything throughout the engagement. Reconciliation of the accounting records to the financial statements. So well, that's pretty important, right? Essentially just your work papers. So making sure that we can tie all of the records and okay, you know, we've got our, our cash rec, we've got our debt roll forward, we've got our fixed asset schedule. All of those are put together. And all those different work papers, right? We're not going to get too into the detail with those. Some of you do have real world experience and some of you do not. And that's quite all right. But essentially, right, we're just trying to tie it out. I mean, just a, a quick note for those of you who do not have experience. Generally, we'll have, uh, let's say this is the beginning balance per the trial balance. And then this is the end balance. And this is just a super quick summary. So this is at 1-1 one, one, and this is in the accounting system. Right. And then this is 1231. And then instead of just trusting what's, you know, the activity will be in the accounting system. But instead of using that, we're going to look at, let's say, the actual transaction history that happened. So if this is debt, here's the beginning debt balance, here's the end debt balance. Well, we're going to tie it out by using the actual documentation from, let's say, the, the bank or you know, whoever they have the debt through. And so hopefully, if this is one and this is three, maybe one million, maybe three million. Hopefully that, that paper, right, will say that we added $2 million of debt and would check, it would clean, cleanly document that, hey, this is actually what happened. So there we go. That's essentially you know, a little work paper in a nutshell, right? So findings that could result in a modification. Uh, I think that goes up saying, right, if there's a, a reason you're going to give them a bad, bad score, you are going to uh, include anything that led you to that reasoning. The auditor's assessment of the risk of material misstatement. Again, whole section on that. Pretty important there. What is the risk of material misstatement, audit risk, all of that good stuff. Description of the audit procedures to be performed. What are we going to do? Are we going to physically be on site? Are we going to review their inventory? Are we going to inspect their PP&E? Are we going to you know, hire specialists to look through that? Because maybe that's not something that we are the most familiar with. So anything like that. Justifications for any departures from 
applicable reporting framework, again, that could be for legitimate reasons. You know, if it makes more sense for them to depart to depart from Gap a little bit, well, if it makes sense, and you know, this will come up you know, throughout the, the course many times, right? You'll even see this in FAR. If it makes sense, we don't want to meet mislead investors or the users of the financial statement. So if it makes sense, then you should do that. You should depart from Gap or whatever you're using. Now, within reason, I mean, you know, that's uh, that's a whole nother topic there. Significant findings and agreements, just anything that if you were going in and looking at someone's audit, you would think is important that you should not exclude. Other documentations, confirmations, bank and account reconciliations, just essentially your work papers, right? Super important and the evidence going into those work papers. All right, documenting significant findings. The auditor is required to document the aggregate effect of uncorrected misstatements on the financial statements. So what does that mean? That means that, okay, over here, we've got a $2 difference. Over here, we've got a $3 difference. However, we gotta add up all of the uncorrected misstatements and see if they are material, see, are, see if they are significant. Right, so the effect of uncorrected misstatements on key ratios and compliance. Now, what does that mean? Also, if the company has a, a bank loan and the bank says you need to maintain a certain current ratio, and well, looks like the company is not because whatever reason, right? They 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 spent too much money or they took on too much debt. You should definitely document that. You know, whether it's from a bank or it's a you know a legal authority, uh, the government, you know, any of these institutions. You know, might have to get a reason or desire to put ratio compliance covenants, you know, on the on debt or anything like that. Uh, and whether or not materiality has been exceeded, that would not be good. The auditor should document findings that could result in a modification of the auditor's report. Very good there. The extent of the audit documentation. Well, what would this be affected by? Now. There are audits that can be done in a day because it might be someone making $100,000 a year with their company and it's just working out of their garage. And I don't know why they'd get an audit. They'd probably get a review or something lesser in scale, but essentially that does exist. Or you could have an audit with uh, at a big four firm with 40 people working on it 80 hours a week for three months, right? So uh, very much going to play a role in how large the audit file, the audit documentation file is size and complexity, the more complex, the larger the client, the, the larger the documentation is going to be, severity of issues. If there's no issues, we're not going to include much documentation in that note. Any issues the entity may have had in the past, which could affect the current year, right? We don't forget. <laughs> we don't forget if we do something wrong, we're going to continue to document that and keep it in mind. The significance of evidence. So we could have pieces of evidence that are much more important than others. The risk of material misstatement, for sure. If there's a higher risk of material misstatement, yes, we want to definitely document that much more significantly. Uh, the use of estimates and judgment. So these are subjective metrics, which we are going to be professionally skeptical of and use our judgment to decide, are these within reason? And if there's a lot of estimates and judgment on management's part, well, then maybe we want to document that much more. We want to bring someone else in, get another opinion on it. That, that could significantly affect the audit documentation. Lastly, distinct or unusual situations, anything that just doesn't meet what normally happens. If uh, I'm sure, you know, if massive world events, if there's a recession happening, something like that, that would significantly affect the business. It's, you know, much more, more unusual, right? And distinct compared to their usual operating years. So that could affect that documentation as well. The auditor is required to document the aggregate effect of the uncorrected misstatements, right? We saw that before, but it is important. Hey there, are you ready to not only pass your CPA exams, but truly understand and enjoy the material while studying? I know it seems impossible, right? Especially to enjoy the material? We'll do it together. Tap into the power of cpa.examprep.ai, where we've got personalized quizzes, multiple choice questions, memorization guides, flashcards, simulations, all tailored to your learning. Our adaptive study planning puts you on the fastest path to success and lifts you back up if you fall behind. Avoid wasting your precious time and money attempting an exam with a low chance of passing because 
Who wants that? We want to get you through this process as quick as possible. Our exam readiness prediction lets you walk in with confidence, knowing that you're prepared for success on exam day. Thankfully, there's no payment method needed to get started. So why don't you come join us? Visit cpa.examprep.ai and let's achieve your exam success together.